But then let me pose the question um, uh, slightly more directly. Is the concept of originalism something to be entrusted only to the Supreme Court, or should the courts of appeals or the district courts uh, also embrace it or, or reject it affirmatively, uh, reject it in favor of some other method of uh, approaching um, uh, constitutional and even statutory issues? One of the beauties of lower courts is that they're really constrained by precedent. I mean, all the time you see trial judges and appellate judges reaching decisions with which they disagree because they think the precedent is relatively determinate and compels it. And they often express frustration with that. But that is doing what originalism promises to do on the court, but doesn't. It actually constrains judges. And it turns out that there's much less that's open and indeterminate when you are bound by a higher precedent but than when you, you're not. Would you agree that, that, um, that we have other ways, uh, there are other ways of dealing with precedent. For example, um, when uh, a judge who uh, uh, is, con uh, is met with a precedent or a case they don't like, we have a way of either dissing it and calling it dictum or, um, or saying, uh, well, no two cases are alike and looking at different uh, the facts and then coming to a, a totally different result. Is that an illegitimate uh, way for the lower courts uh, to accomplish the same thing that an originalist, for example, uh, on the Supreme Court might, uh, might say. Professor Rappaport? Well, it's no doubt that precedent can be manipulated. That, um, that's one of the problems with, with just trying to rely on precedent. Um, I think that's um, so, you know, what one can point out difficulties in determining the original meaning but there are tremendous difficulties in, in, in determining precedent, especially when the precedents come from different time periods, when we, we often look at two lines of cases which are inconsistent with one another and that are just justified in that way. So, so absolutely, um, uh, it's, it's one of the problems with precedent is this ability to manipulate it. And manipulating it is generally, I guess, a bad thing, um, whether done by both either the Supreme Court or lower court. If, if I Better could. to have it just thrown out by Congress? Better to have, um, I, I guess. well, I mean, if, depending on one's, if, if it's a legitimate precedent, then better to be followed rather than disingenuously. <laughs> um, uh, if, if it's not a legitimate precedent, then to be overturned, um, depending on the, the correct theory of precedent. I think the subject matter of this panel is extraordinarily important. I think it is a very difficult thing for an originalist to reconcile the principles that, are, that we've talked about today, that is approaching the law and trying to get it right while recognizing that there's sometimes other values that have to be placed in equilibrium with that. It's a difficult issue. I think my colleagues all have very thoughtful perspectives on it, but I do think some perspective is necessary here. While they're difficult questions, the fact is originalism, as I suggest in my remarks, posits before the case a clear, well-defined standard toward which the judge or justice ought to be rendering his decisions. It defines the universe of evidence that, 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 that's reasonable to be considered in the process and it posits an end goal toward which the decisions of the judge ought to be directed. It is, it is difficult to perfectly live up to those standards. Uh, judges can be more or less principled in their application of originalism, but you do have these clear standards before the case. Now, I know it's not the subject of this panel, but you consider every other contemporary jurisprudence and ask yourself what the standards are of that alternative principle of jurisprudence. I read Justice Breyer's book, and Justice Breyer is an old friend of mine. I have great regard for him, but I still don't understand what issues or what standards he poses before the case so that his subsequent decisions will meet the standard and the appearance of fairness. The appearance of fairness is, is satisfied by originalism because the judge promises to live up as best as he can, however imperfectly, to certain standards. All these alternative schools of jurisprudence run afoul of that problem. What are the standards that they present? And 
to compare interpretivism or originalism where there may be some imperfectibility in achieving standards with alternative schools that have no standards at all that are meaningfully binding upon a judge, I think that's comparing apples and oranges and I think everybody needs to take a couple steps back in this debate to respect the strengths of originalism uh, while we recognize its, its, its imperfections and shortcomings. Professor Strauss? Yeah, just one quick, quick word. And we talk about precedent. Um, you know, the, the idea that law consists of following precedent, that's not new. Uh, there, that's that's the, 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 uh, the core of the common law. And the common law has been around for centuries. Uh, long antedated our Constitution. Um, Edmund Burke, the great conservative, took the common law as his model for how society should change. It was a well-established institution even then, at the end of the 18th century. Um, and it is a, while it is not, you know, algorithmic, it's not determinative, it doesn't yield results in a mathematical way. I have to say, I mean, uh, Justice Markman might not like me, like to hear me say this, but I think it's very much the attitude he expressed which is, listen, this is, I mean, in tough cases, uh, it's a hard job. I have a lot of things I have to keep in balance, and I'm, I'm not going to sort of uh, go jackrabbiting off in one direction. I'm going to think this through carefully. I'm going to try to get it right. I'm going to be humble. If people have come to a certain conclusion before, I'm not going to discard that lightly. Um, that's the common law, uh, and the common law governed property, contract, court, large chunks of the criminal law, governed that successfully for hundreds of years. So yes, there is some indeterminacy. Yes, there is room for the judge's policy views to come into play. Yes, precedent can be manipulated. All of that is true. But when we contrast originalism to precedent, we are contrasting originalism to a system that has worked pretty well in many contexts in the law for hundreds of years and that expresses attitudes that, as I said, I mean, I think uh, Justice Markman expressed very, way, very well are wholly admirable attitudes for judges to have. And if I could quickly put in a plug for David's uh, forthcoming book, The Living Constitution, which is just a wonderful defense of this common law constitutionalist uh, tradition uh, written in an accessible and engaging uh, style. It's just a great book to read. You really make the claim that, in fact, when you compare the two, the common law approach constrains judges much more significantly than originalism that the historical claims are so malleable, originalists pick and choose among these different methodologies so, uh, so inconsistently that in the end the, the minimalist common law judge is the true conservative and the originalists are actually less constrained. Professor so, Rappaport? So, so a couple of things. So first of all, it's true the common law has, has governed matters, but for, for most of the time period and most of that, that common law was common law that could be revised by the legislature. We talk about a constitutional common law. We're, we're talking about something completely different. But on this point about constraint, I'm, I'm quite interested. Um, I can understand that a, a kind of conservative common law, one which, which did not depart from, had very, very gradual changes, would have you know, significant constraint on the judges. But um, I'm assuming that that kind of common law, if, if, if one wanted constraint and, and that kind of common law, then one thinks that that radical period of time called the New Deal um, is all impermissible. What the New Deal court did was impermissible. What the Warren court did was, was impermissible. Um, in other words, it's one thing to talk about constraint uh, where you actually have not, you know, precedents that are actually followed. When you've got the ability to follow some and not to follow others, then there's no longer any constraint. The basic idea is that precedents which have the same degree of support that a constitutional amendment would have, that have you know, a strong consensus behind them. Um, that those Measured how? Because I, I can hear that question. Measured how? Well, let me just first of all uh, just state what it is. So the, the basic idea is, is, is that those precedents should, should be followed. Measured how? Um, ultimately, the judges will, will, will have to make a determination on, on this matter. But, um, uh, and, so, so that's that's unfortunately inevitable in in making precedents. I mean, the but but um, um, in, in deciding whether to overturn a precedent. But um, I I think actually you go through my examples. I don't I don't you know. So, think you would necessarily disagree with them. So Citizens United was wrong because eighty percent of the people oppose it. It should be overturned tomorrow. Well. Uh, no, the, the only. Well, now you're going to see why, why I'm a district court judge, and I get to cut off arguments. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, but 
But that's not the justification, right? right? The justification for that, um, you may agree or disagree, is that that's an original meaning decision, right? And so that doesn't, um, so, so, so you would, oh, oh, sorry, so you're saying, saying well, 80%, I don't think 80% uh, think that. And, and I don't ABC think it has that degree of pretty. Well, I don't think it has that degree of consensus behind it. Um, uh, I'd like to see the, the, the question on that. The, the basic point is, is how well accepted is that? Um, and I, I tend to, to doubt that it has that degree. Well, it's not just historical analysis that we're looking at either. I agree with my colleagues that historical analysis is often very ambiguous and is not always dispositive. But the words in the First Amendment, no law, are deserving of some respect because we're not talking about originalism in the sense of trying to read what was in James Madison's mind, but originalism in the sense of trying to understand what he meant, meant by the words no law. That's what originalism is today. It's not an attempt to understand what he secretively said to Dolly Madison when he was in there when they were in the bedroom together going to sleep, it's to try to understand what the words meant to the framers at the time. And the real common law is distinct from the kind of constitutional common law we're talking here, not only on the basis of what Professor Rappaport says, that the real common law can be altered by and can be trumped by legislation, but with respect to the real common law, there's no positive law with which to compare it and to determine whether or not it meets certain standards. And in fact, the real common law had genuine standards of custom and practice that had evolved and that had been analyzed over the centuries. So it's not quite right to say that there was an absence of standards there as there is with respect to the development of the so-called constitutional common law. Very quick point. There is the no law position. Justice Black, no law means no law. Justice Thomas does not take that position, nor does Justice Scalia. Thomas says speech in school, you can ban it. Cross-burning, not speech. He's not a First Amendment absolutist. Uh, and if it's not supported by uh, originalist history, this sounds more like Earl Warren to me than, than originalism. 